During the time that Tim Walls was governor, five infants were born alive after failed abortion attempts. None of these infants were giving life-saving medical care. Instead, Tim Walls is letting them die in the state of Minnesota. That is his policy. We are dealing with the most pro-abortion presidential ticket in American history. When you were separated from Sawyer and she had him for the first year of his life, how did you end up meeting him for the first time and what was that like? I remember I was just held him until he fell asleep and then he was sleeping next to me and I was just laying there on the floor and I remember just breaking down crying. Like I finally met my son. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we're doing a news roundup. We haven't done one of those in a couple weeks, and oh my goodness, there is a ton of news to talk about. As you all know, Kamala Harris is now running for president, no longer VP, now the president. She also has named her VP, Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota. We're going to talk about Kamala Harris's record on abortion. I think it's essential that you know about it. We also are talking about some news coming out of California. Recently, Governor Gavin Newsom signed a bill into law in California that prohibits schools from telling parents if their child, including their young child, thinks that they are transgender. Yes, now there's this right to privacy for little kids. If they go to school, the school has to affirm their chosen gender identity, and the parents may have no clue. And lastly, we talk with Harrison Tinsley, who shares about his custody battle for his son fighting an ex who was trying to trans his young child. All this and more on today's episode of the Lila Rose Podcast. Good Ranchers delivers some of the best beef, poultry, and pork directly to your door, directly from farmers and ranchers in the United States. I love Good Ranchers because it's American meat delivered and the meat is delicious, especially the chicken. I love the chicken breasts. GoodRanchers.com has an amazing promotion going on right now where if you sign up for a subscription box and you use the code Lila, you get $25 off your box, you get free fast shipping, and you get to add on a free delicious product of chicken breast, bacon, ground beef, or salmon. So go to GoodRanchers.com today, support your local ranchers, and partner with a company that supports your pro-life and pro-family values. And use the code LILA at checkout for $25 off your first subscription order in addition to free shipping and your choice of ground beef, chicken breast, those are my favorite, salmon or bacon. Go to GoodRanchers.com today and enjoy delicious American meat delivered. So I've been tracking presidential elections now for probably the last 15 years. And I remember back when Biden and Obama were running for president, I remember talking about their platform and how it was at the time the most pro-abortion platform in American history. President Obama, when he was then a state senator, would actually vote several times against the Born Alive Infants Protection Act. He was so pro-abortion that then state senator Obama didn't even want children who survived abortion attempts in his state to receive life-saving medical care. That's how pro-abortion he was. And Biden, when he joined Obama's ticket, together their platform was to be against any abortion restriction. So they wanted to repeal any abortion restriction and enshrine abortion on demand for any reason. So it was pretty extreme, especially when he was up against a candidate who said that he was pro-life. At the time, it was John McCain, as you guys remember. And of course, we ended up with years of President Barack Obama. Under President Obama's leadership, the money to Planned Parenthood increased, and he had multiple visits, in fact, dozens of visits from Planned Parenthood's leadership coming to the White House to get special privileges. Now, this is all, of course, horrific, but what are we dealing with today? The reality is, and I hate to say this, but the reality is the current Kamala Harris and Tim Walls ticket is even more pro-abortion than the Biden-Obama ticket. We are dealing with the most pro-abortion presidential ticket in American history. Now, what does that mean? What does that look like concretely with the policies? Well, it's one thing to do policy. It's another thing to signal what you believe to voters and have some sort of a moral leadership presentation to other people about what you say that you care about and you believe. I want to start with that. So Tim Walls was recently announced as the VP pick for Kamala Harris. This is an example of what Tim Walls has to say. And my record is so pro-choice, Nancy Pelosi asked me if I should tone it down. I stand with Planned Parenthood, and we won. 
There's Tim Walz, governor of Minnesota, saying that even Nancy Pelosi, who's very pro-abortion, mind you, she's so pro-abortion that she, her own bishop, her archbishop in San Francisco, says she can't receive Holy Communion because she is so for abortion. Even Nancy Pelosi told Governor Tim Walz to tone it down because he's such a zealot in support of abortion. As governor of Minnesota, Tim Walz expanded abortion to the point where abortion on demand is permitted through all nine months of pregnancy for any reason. But it gets worse. During the time that Tim Walls was governor, five infants were born alive after failed abortion attempts. None of these infants were giving life-saving medical care. All of them were left to die. These are infants that were born alive. They were viable, they were born alive, and they were left to die. Of course, people might say, well, these babies were probably very sick anyways. They would have died anyways. The reality is, even those that are sick and may be dying deserve comfort care, deserve medical care, deserve life-saving care if their lives can be saved. If a child gets a terrible disease, they get cancer, we still fight for their life. We still try to protect them. If they have a disability, we still try to work alongside their disability to protect them, to care for them. But that's not what is being offered to babies born alive after abortion attempts. Instead, Tim Walls is letting them die in the state of Minnesota. That is his policy. And here's the reality. Babies that survive abortion attempts, some of them, if they're given the care that they deserve because that's their human right, their right to life, they go on to live long lives. As an example, Gianna Jessen, who is a friend of mine, somebody that Life Action, my organization, has worked with to tell her story, she was born alive after a failed abortion attempt in a Planned Parenthood in Los Angeles. And a nurse in the clinic had pity on her and mercy on her and whisked her away to provide her life-saving medical care. She is now in her 40s traveling the world to advocate for the rights of all children. Imagine if instead of being whisked away and being given life-saving care, Gianna was just left to die in that abortion clinic. The reality is these are human beings. They deserve the right to life and they deserve medical care as a very basic standard of the treatment, the way we should treat pre-born and born lives. And that's not, unfortunately, what Governor Walls wants. So I think the difference here is President Obama was a state senator. He didn't have much power. He had some. Governor Tim Walls has had the power of being the lead executive in the state of Minnesota. And he shows you, he has shown you what he will do with that power when it comes to abortion. And it's very scary. And it should concern any voter who's contemplating how they're going to vote in November. In addition, I want to talk about Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is a particularly unique candidate in my view because she's not only radically pro-abortion like Obama was, like Biden is, she's not only for removing any abortion restriction and limitation, she wants full rights or choice for any woman to have an abortion at any point in pregnancy for any reason, but it's one step more with Kamala Harris because Kamala Harris, again, a proven track record here, has shown that not only is she radically pro-abortion, not only is she somebody who's going to do whatever Planned Parenthood wants her to do, she is someone who's going to use her power to go after those that disagree with her, her political opponents. What does this look like? What does this mean? Let's look at her track record when she served as the attorney general of the state of California. Kamala Harris was the AG of California. She used her power to trample the First Amendment rights of the investigative reporters, David Delighton and Sandra Mayer, two people I consider friends. David Delighton and Sandra had exposed the sale of baby body parts at abortion clinics, including Planned Parenthood. They had actually gotten undercover footage, sitting down in restaurants, going to conferences, showing Planned Parenthood, talking about how they would sell the body parts of the children that they savagely murdered. Take a lesson. So I say, okay, what are your, what are you looking to supply today? We've been very good at getting parts, long liver. Dr. Deborah Nukatola, Planned Parenthood's Director of Medical Services, an abortion provider discussing how to collect body parts from aborted fetuses over lunch at a California restaurant. So I'm not going to crush that part. I'm going to basically crush below, I'm going to crush above, and then I'm going to see if I get out of the tax. For example, so I had eight case, cases yesterday. 
and I knew exactly what we needed, and I kind of looked at the list, and I said, all right, this 17-weeker has eight plans. I knew which were the cases that were probably more likely to yield what we needed, and I made my decisions according to that, too. So it's worth having a huddle at the beginning of the day, uh -huh. and that's what I do. I think the per-item thing works a little better just because we can see how much we can get out of it. I always try and keep the trunk intact just, just by function of always trying to aim for the spine to bring it down. Now, there's one thing here. This is illegal. Thankfully, it's still illegal to traffic baby body parts. It's against federal law. The reality is Planned Parenthood is killing babies. That should be illegal. Unfortunately, it's not. Tragically, it's not. We're working to change that. But then in addition, they're selling the body parts of the babies that they kill. And then they go on to break that law. That's a federal law that they're breaking. When David and Sandra exposed this, what should have happened in California, if there's any justice, is the Attorney General of California should have gone after Planned Parenthood. And the federal, federal authorities should have gone after Planned Parenthood for their illicit activities. But instead, what did Kamala Harris do as AG? She went after David Daleiden. She actually sent state agents to David Daleiden's apartment at the time in Orange County with guns drawn to raid his apartment and to steal, I say steal because it was unjust, to take his laptops and his hard drives, which had the footage of the, of the sale of baby body parts on it. Why would she do this? Why would Kamala Harris do this? Well, she's zealously pro-abortion, but in addition, at the time, she had a Senate campaign. She was running for the Senate, and she was accepting money from Planned Parenthood for her Senate campaign. In fact, she was at Planned Parenthood, event, Planned Parenthood events during this same time, raising awareness for her campaign and support for her campaign. In reality, what happened was that Planned Parenthood wanted Kamala Harris to go after the First Amendment rights of journalists who dared to expose the abortion industry and their heinous deeds. And Kamala Harris used her authority as attorney general instead of going after the abortion clinics, killing babies, selling their body parts, committing all kinds of heinous acts. She went after the journalists who dared expose what the abortion clinics were doing. This is who we are dealing with as now the potential future president of the United States. Now look at what has happened under the Department of Justice even during the Biden-Harris administration in the last four years. There have been several pro-lifers who have been literally thrown into jail, into federal prison because of their pro-life advocacy. They've been charged with these trumped up charges through the FACE Act saying that because they advocated and did civil disobedience and protests, peaceful protests at abortion clinics, not only will they get penalized for that, but they'll get additional penalties, federal penalties and felonies, which could lead to years in federal prison because they were collaborating to stop abortions happening at these clinics. So they're adding on these extra penalties for these brave activists like Joan Bell and Lauren Handy. 78-year-old Joan Bell is a grandma and a mother, a loving, prayerful woman who was doing white rose rescues. Lauren Handy is a young woman who was doing white rose rescues to try to peacefully use their bodies to stop the abortionists from coming in to kill these babies. But again, not only were they penalized for trespass and for blocking access in the clinic in that way, but they were also given additional federal penalties. And this is where the administration, the Biden administration, is going after them politically for doing that and slapping excessive charges on them to throw them in jail for years. Yes, that was Kamala Harris's administration over the last four years. But imagine how much worse it could get when she used her role as AG to go after David Delighted and Sandra Merritt in California. You should also know about the legislation that Kamala Harris helped co-sponsor to unfairly target pregnancy resource centers. She wanted to go after pregnancy resource centers to get them to force them to advertise abortion, other clinics that do abortion, to the patients that come in seeking material resource and free counseling. So she was so she's so pro-abortion that she even wants your local pregnancy center, which is not getting government money. The abortion clinics, many of them get government money. Planned Parenthood gets over half of a billion dollars in government money. But she wants to force pregnancy centers to have to do abortion ads effectively in their facilities to push abortion even on the women seeking potentially life-affirming options and help for their pregnancies. So we are dealing with the most pro-abortion ticket, I hate to say this, in American history. We're going to be talking about this more in the podcast, but I wanted to make sure we included these facts for you in the news roundup so that you knew what we're dealing with when it comes to the Kamala Harris and the Tim Walls ticket. And another news item that you have to know about, especially for those tracking California politics or who live in California, as you guys know, I'm in California 
Governor Gavin Newsom just signed a law into effect a few weeks ago that would make it so that any school administrator or teacher is not allowed in certain circumstances to even tell parents whether or not their student might be struggling with gender identity. So what this looks like practically is if a student goes to school and maybe they're eight years old or maybe they're preteen and they're struggling with their identity, which by the way is a totally normal thing for many preteens to go through. They're going through puberty or maybe they have a mental health issue or mental health struggles. And if they are struggling with their gender identity and they express it in any way to the teacher, to school administration, or maybe the teacher is an activist and is pushing that on the kids, the parents by law cannot necessarily be notified. So currently, if you have a student that goes to a school, they take an Advil. They have issues with their behavior, bullying, or they are a bully. They go to the principal's office, whatever it is. If there's an issue, a mental health issue that is detected that a child might have, the parents need to be notified because the parents have responsibility to care for their child. That's their job and that's what they want to do. But now if the child is struggling with gender identity or the teacher thinks the child is struggling with ide gender identity, they can now keep this a secret from parents. So parents won't even know that maybe their child is going to school. Some activist teacher is putting a dress, helping them put on a dress if they're a boy or opposite gender clothing if they're a girl and then encouraging them using pronouns like they, them or she, her, depending on what the child thinks. And then the parents have no idea this is happening. So the whole school is required to keep this a secret from the parents. This law was called the Safety Act, which is, of course, a misnomer, claiming this is going to make kids more safe. No, this is more dangerous for kids because now the people that are responsible for them, that love them the most, can actually help them and guide them and be there for them, their own parents. The reality is that Governor Newsom is very much pushed by and controlled by, I would say, not just the abortion lobby, but the LGBTQ plus I lobby in the state of California. And so he's often just signing legislation for whatever they want. And of course they want this because there's often a, a push to separate parents from their kids who know them best, usually love them best, in order for the child to be at the whims of whatever the gender activist or ideology is being pushed at that school. One other news update that has some positivity to it, I know this has kind of been a heavy one today, guys, is a conversation that I had recently with Harrison Tinsley, who's a father from Northern California. He actually recently won his custody battle. So he became big in the news over the last year when he was sharing about how he was in a custody battle for his then three-year-old, two-year-old son, Sawyer, with an ex who wanted to transgender or make them non-binary, the child is a little boy, make the boy non-binary. So according to the court documents, this mother would try to trans the boy. She'd put girls clothes on him so he couldn't take rides at Disney when they went to Disney unless he wore princess shoes, uh, glitter themed birthday parties, pushing her agenda at the time, which is her ideology on this child. Harrison, of course, the father was fighting for custody. And finally, he has just won custody. I think it's important to share Harrison's story. While it's in some ways a success story for Harrison winning custody, the reality is the reason that he won custody in California isn't because the ex was trying to trans her son, but because the ex had other issues that she was struggling with. This detail is important because the reality is the fight is on more than ever in California and across the country because there is still gender ideology gripping this mind virus, gripping the minds of many in the medical profession, many in our polit political system who are thinking that a young child can choose their gender, decide their gender, and then it is up for medical professionals and parents to endlessly affirm even to the point of giving life-altering hormone drugs, doing life-altering surgeries, things that can be devastating to the child in the long run. WeHeartNutrition.com is a family-owned, American-based company that creates wholesome supplements for your body at any stage of life. I love WeHeartNutrition.com because they're using the highest quality ingredients that are research-backed, that are in their most bio-available form. That means they're most easily absorbed by your body. I also love that WeHeartNutrition.com designs their vitamin packages specifically for where you are in your life or your health journey. So they have packages to help you achieve fertility so that you can conceive. They have packages for when you do conceive and it's a great prenatal. They have a great package that I have right now for when you're postnatal after you've just had a baby to resupply all the nutrients in your body, the vitamins, the minerals. They also have packages that are premenopausal and postmenopausal. And they of course have your standard everyday vitamin 
for the every woman. Check out reheartnutrition.com, order a bundle of vitamins directly to your door and get the supplements that are best designed for your health. Go to weheartnutrition.com and don't forget to use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. That's Lila at checkout for 20% off your order. One last thing I have to share that I love about We Heart Nutrition is that this is a company that is pro-life and pro-family and a company that donates a full 10% of the sale back to the Pregnancy Resource Center movement. So your money is going to help moms and babies in need, and you're getting an amazing vitamin and supplement. So go to weheartnutrition.com, put in your order, use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off your order. Harrison Tinsley, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a dream come true. So we just found out before sitting down that we're both from San Jose, basically San Jose. Yeah, San Jose, California. Great yeah. place to grow up. I it feel like I got a- the last golden age of it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. Like it's meaning it's going kind of downhill right now. Well, and and just kind of, I meant more so even just the before social media yes. and cell phones more so. Meaning we were the last, the last generation before the chaos of social media, you and me. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of true. And then we have some stuff in common too. We both went to West Valley College at one point. Yep. Love that. Good old days. So you've all, you're all over the news right now, Harrison, and some people listening probably know some of your story, or maybe this is the first time they're hearing. So I want to start with what the news story is right now, and then I want to go backwards in time to where you got to where you are today. So what are, can you tell us about the, the headline, some of the headline news that you've been caught up in in just the last few weeks? I finally saved Sawyer and I have full custody of him. It's a miracle. I'm just so unbelievably grateful and you can just never imagine the way God works in your life and how things pan out. But um, it's just so wonderful to feel that I have that control, that he's safe. So Sawyer is how old? He's four and a half years old. He's four and a half years old, super cute. And you have full custody. And tell us more about this custody battle that you were in and what, 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 was, what was it over? Give us some of the background on it. Well, it goes way back to all the way to pregnancy. I was dating a girl in the Bay Area and she got pregnant shortly into our relationship. And thankfully she wanted to have him. And we both went to doctor's appointments together. We found out it was a boy. We were both super stoked upon that. We came up with the name Sawyer together, Mm -hmm. wonderful name. And uh, we just had this like political disagreement and essentially it seemed like she couldn't get over that and it was always used against me. I was just threatened daily that like, oh, you're not gonna see Sawyer if this or that over political stuff and she'd bring up questions like oh what would you do if our kid was trans and it just caused a lot of tension there was a post that when she announced to everyone that she was pregnant on social media she said baby sawyer due in december i'll love you whether you're a boy or girl or neither so that was pretty concerning and you know it just got really hostile and she ended up you know keeping him from me she broke up with me sent me a cease and desist letter Uh, which I respected and I found out he was born about one week after from social media and I filed in court two months later and it took 13 more months just to meet him. So I never got to hold him, look in his eyes, touch him for 15 months of his life and that was an extreme heartbreak that I can't really describe but I try to look at it as making me a stronger, better man for what was to come next in life and to be a better dad for him. When you said you were dis- in disagreement about politics, you mentioned that she was already you know, making, con- making notes even on social media about whether or not he's a boy or a girl, even though it was a boy, obviously he's a boy. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the other things that she seemed really offended about with your, you said your political views? Oh, we just disagreed on many of the main topics like abortion, guns, and transgender rights, things like that. So because you were, as an example, pro-life, you were against abortion, she wanted you to not see your son when he was born. Well, I, obviously I can't speak for her and I don't really know what's in her heart and mind during all of this, but it, it sure seemed like it was politically motivated, yeah. And then when you uh, were separated from Sawyer and she had him for the first year of his life, how did you end up meeting him for the first time and what was that like? Well, there was all sorts of stuff in court and emails between attorneys, et cetera, and me just anxiously fighting for him and waiting and waiting and waiting. And when I first met him, I remember just looking him in the eyes and it just felt like pure 
miracle frequency, like all through the air, just full of magic and love. And I just felt like this connection immediately that I can't really describe. It was just absolutely miraculous feeling. And, you know, and I hugged him and I remember I was spending this day with him. They made the visits less fun in the very beginning. Like there had to be someone there and they were like taking notes on me. And, but I remember I, I got to put him down for his nap time. And this whole time I had just done my best to be strong and fight through all this. And I remember I just held him until he fell asleep. And then he was sleeping next to me and I was just laying there on the floor. And I remember just breaking down, crying. Like I finally met my son. Like I finally got to experience actually being a dad. So during this time, were you paying child support, but then you weren't getting your rights to be able to have visitation? Like what was the kind of law, the legal realities at this time? At that exact time, I finally got visitation and it was established that I was his father via DNA test. 99.9% mm -hmm. um, .9 accurate from DNA saliva sample. And I was being, I believe, added to his birth certificate and having his name changed to add my last name as well. And I was starting visitation with him. And I fought through all these visits. They got like less and less strict as time went on. So then I was by myself with him and it was amazing. And I moved to the Bay Area. I had been living in Tahoe. And when I did that, I filed in court and I won half custody almost immediately. And I'm extremely thankful for that. Uh, but around that time also, his mom, she started to call him the they, them and like post pictures of him in dresses or like makeup and weird stuff like that. How old was he at this point? Like a year and a half, in between a year and a half to two years old, was in that realm. And we had half custody and I, I filed for full custody. And there was also a bunch of little broken court orders, but you know, that happens all the time in court. So those were the, the main topics. And then there was, there was the other thing is, is she was arrested for a felony child endangerment with Sawyer and placed on a 5150 hold. And the police actually didn't even call me that night. So I had half custody of Sawyer and I didn't even know that happened. Where was Sawyer I, when she was in jail? Right, he went with her parents, mm -hmm. but like they didn't have custody of him. And I felt that was very inappropriate that he, I wasn't called immediately to pick him up. So, I mean, I did everything I could to sort of go after that, not being okay with the police mm -hmm. and stuff, but nothing ever came of it. And then there was a CPS investigation and they did call me. But when CPS called me, they said, oh, you have nothing to worry about. I just had to look at Sawyer there was a misunderstanding and he fell off a bed. And I was like, oh, okay. But I was smart enough to request a copy of the, you know, police report. And I got that. And then I ended up subsequently getting the police body cam footage, which was even crazier. And my original motion for court was actually denied. And I did a motion for reconsideration with the body cam footage added and it was accepted. The motion for reconsideration is very low chances to get granted. But we ended up having a four day trial about all of this. And it ended up actually being five days. They gave us one more day. In spite of all of that, the court decided to keep custody 50, 50. Mm -hmm. And they said that they wouldn't rule on the gender thing. Now, thankfully they didn't rule with her. Although Sawyer adamantly says he's a boy from that time till now, he's never once wavered from that. He'll scream at you. I'm a boy, not a girl. He has not bought into it one bit. And I thank God for that. I'm just so thankful that I was there to guide him. And I got there in time. So they decided to keep custody 50, 50. I decided I was going to appeal that. So I appealed it with my attorney. I decided that I was going to come out publicly and tell the world my story. I felt like people needed to know. And I'm thankful to, you know, Matt Walsh and the daily wire. They broke my story and somehow it got a lot of traction and I just sort of started doing every interview I could and going to the Capitol and speaking about anti-parent, anti-family bills in California that are crazy, like AB 957 was the one I was trying to fight the most. And that was one saying that family courts had to essentially give custody to the affirming parent. I told them, okay, well, I'm gonna be the first one to get custody because Sawyer says he's a boy. So I'm the affirming <laughs> parent. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but thankfully Newsom vetoed that, but he unfortunately signed, you know, AB 1955 this year. Um, what is AB 1955 in California that Gavin Newsom just signed? Yeah, it's a bill where Basically, schools have to keep secrets regarding gender. Um, if their kids kids confused by gender or thinks they're a boy or girl or whatever fake thing they have, they're confusing kids with these days that they will have to keep that secret from the parents and not tell the parents. When you were starting to speak out about your story, 
how did people personally in your life, and this is ongoing custody battle with, with Sawyer's mom, how did people in your life respond? The people closest to me were all super supportive of me. Um, I'm sure a few expressed their doubts of me, like talking about it publicly, but you know, my family is a very loving, supportive family. And I feel like, and so I have some really close friends and relationships and I feel that everyone had my back. Have you run into people like, you know, we're both from the Bay Area. We know the Bay Area can be very left wing, especially with like abortion and gender ideology. There's some crazy stuff out there. San Francisco obviously is known to be this, uh, you know, very LGBTQ plus I affirming place, et cetera. What, when you uh, would talk with just like, you know, meeting people in general in the community of San Jose, did you find people expressing support for you or people more expressing distrust of you and support for Sawyer's mom doing this transitioning of this two-year-old? Yeah. So I think San Jose is a much better place than San Francisco. And I've actually yet to meet anyone in San Jose, parents in particular, that support any of this. Everyone I meet there completely thinks that no secrets should be held from parents, that no kids under 18 should transition or get any sort of surgery or hormones in any way, and that no um, guys should be in girls' sports or spaces at all. That's my actual reality living there. I haven't yet to meet anyone who supports it. I'm sure there's a few fringe people that do, but literally the vast majority of people there, Democrat, Republican, or otherwise are all against it. And I think we need to band together to protect kids and protect life. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was, that's been my experience. I mean, I still visit San Jose regularly. My, my folks are still there, many of them. And uh, yeah, they are every average day person, I think out there. And I would say in California generally thinks that the gender ideology stuff has gone way too far. It's crazy what we're doing to kids. There are many people who are pro-life or at least like amenable to some abortion restrictions. They think that this abortion through all nine months is insane and they seem to actually ha prefer family values. They want family values, but you see the political agenda in California is so far left. It's out of touch with most of the people here. It's completely out of touch. I don't know who our representatives are representing. <laughs> Um, but I think we need to ha start people having to step up, run for, you know, Senate and assembly and their local districts and school boards and just speak out more. People need to just be courageous and speak the mm -hmm. truth. I mean, you start to speak the truth. It opens up your soul when you're, when you're lying and when you're afraid to say what you believe you're weakening your soul. And when you start to speak this truth and have courage, God opens up your life in ways you just can't even imagine. I mean, look at mine. I've now won full custody of Sawyer. I've met all these incredible people. I'm part of this movement and this purpose of fighting for children and for life. And people read the Bible and, and they watch Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. And they, they look back on World War II and, and the Civil War and like, oh, I would have helped hide the Jews. And I, I would have brought the slaves to the North. And I would have been on the, the rebel side in Star Wars. And I would have helped destroy the ring and Lord of the Rings or, or whatever. You have a chance right now. This is the battle of our lifetime. Children are the most amazing, vulnerable, innocent, deserving of protection and love amongst mm -hmm. us. And our, our battle is to protect children from gender ideology and to protect children's lives, to keep them alive, to give them that chance. And everyone like watching, you have this chance right now to be a part of something. Your World War II moment, whatever you want to call it, it's right here. Mm -hmm. There's, this is children we're talking about. I mean, this is just absolutely ludicrous and everyone knows it. We can't put up with it anymore. Like if your kids said they were a pirate, you wouldn't poke their mm -hmm. eye out and chop off their leg. They said they wanted a tattoo, you wouldn't give them one. If they wanted to drink alcohol, you wouldn't let them. If, if they wanted to be Spider-Man, you're not going to take them to tall buildings and say, okay, swing to the next one, jump. But for this one thing, we're just pretending it's okay and going along with it and we need to stop lying and affirming delusions. We need to tell the truth and just save the kids. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing diaper and wipes company, and it is America's pro-life diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because the team that created this product had you and your family and your little ones in mind. It's a best-in-class product with great materials that is designed for the comfort and the care of your baby. Everylife.com will deliver diapers and wipes directly to your door and know that whenever you purchase diapers from Everylife.com, you are helping support the pro-life movement because Everylife.com gives back part of their proceeds directly 
directly to support pro-life organizations that serve babies and their mothers. So go to everylife.com today, get some diapers and wipes for your little one or for a loved one's little one, and use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com. And don't forget to use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. Why do you think we got to the place that we're at with all of the lies that are being told and the confusion? I think we're here because of lack of courage and people just being too afraid to say what they believe and just going along with it. I mean, that's how all the greatest atrocities in history have happened is everyone was too scared to speak up until it came to their front door. Yeah, that as well as like media and social media just pushing these ideas, trying to make them seem bigger than they are, it's mm -hmm. then instilling fear inside of people to speak out against it and pretending that they're the majority when they're not. The majority of us know this is wrong and that we should protect children, protect life, protect women. And hopefully this is the moment in history where this shifts. I really think we have the momentum, the high ground, and this could be the moment where we stop this. I mean, for sure in the next mm -hmm. 10 years, I believe this will be gone. You see all these other countries in Europe, et cetera, are banning it. Mm -hmm. And only Canada and the US are moving forward, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And there is also some states here that have banned it, and I'm thankful for that, but quite frankly, it's not enough. We need more people to speak up. We need legislation. We need to hold everyone accountable who's ever mutilated a child. They are not old enough to consent to sex, to surgery, to hormones. And I'm sorry that it has to come to that, but ultimately we cannot put up with evil. We have to stand up to it. It's such a good point when you, what you're saying that if they can't consent to sex, obviously any kind of sexual activity with a child is sexual abuse. It's horrific. But why is it okay to, for a child to consent to consent to having their sexual organs removed or, or adjusted or impacted through medications when they're not too young to consent to sex? Right. And you see detransitioners like mm -hmm. Chloe Cole, who's amazing, come out and tell their story. How can you hear that? And then mm -hmm. still think it's a good idea to do this. And there's, there's way more than just Chloe. There's, there's thousands of kids in the same boat or adults now who regret it. And it's just the evidence is so clear. There's the CAS files from UK, the WPATH files coming out of the mm -hmm. United States. And we see that like these lies told to parents to coerce them into doing it. It happened to Elon Musk even, you know, he, you hear him tell his story and I'm so thankful that he's going to move his businesses out of California over AB 1955. You know, that's just such a big, big move for someone with so much power and influence to do something over a transgender bill, but- um, Are you planning to stay in California? I think that California is savable and that the majority of people here, like we discussed mm -hmm. earlier, are against this and want to live good lives, truthful lives and have a safe place for their kids. I totally agree. That's, I think that it's a matter of like, honestly, media in many ways and the power of social media to get the right messages out there and create the right, in a way, air cover for the right legislators and politicians to do the right thing. Because right now, if you look at most of media and entertainment media, it's so far left. And so people think that's what everyone thinks, even though the reality is most people are com pretty reasonable. They, they really want common sense. They don't want these crazy ideologies. And you're, you're an example of what it looks like to fight, even when you're really faced with the thick of it. I mean, this is your kid, your child that you had to fight directly for okay, what happened next with yeah. your the, the mom of Sawyer? So you were saying you're up back to 50-50 custody. You're still fighting. It's escalating. How did it go to full custody for you? Well, she at one point was trying to get full custody from you, right? Well, I mean, she just originally had full custody. And I believe it just sort of stayed for half custody this whole time. She didn't try to change it too much. There were some mm -hmm. small court um, disagreements during this time that you're asking mm -hmm. about. Uh, as well as my appeal ongoing to get full custody and me thinking of any way of I can do anything to save him. And one day I'm, I'm just laying there and had a bunch of missed calls and I checked it and it was the San Francisco police and they're telling me to pick up my son. It had been about an hour. I'd missed these calls. Um, I was spending time with my now wife, who's amazing. And I met mm -hmm. because of all of this. Congratulations. And so <laughs> yeah, I'm so thankful for that. Mm -hmm. It's like the most beautiful love story. And it just seems so divine how we met, but yeah. So I called them back. I was like, I'll be there in one hour. I'm leaving right now. And I went and picked Sawyer up and I filed an ex parte the day after, I believe it was that or the day after that. I think it was the very next day though, with my attorney requesting temporary full custody because of what had happened.
And, you know, that's why the police called me. And she was arrested for something like assault and battery and elder abuse. Yeah, I mean, I, I brought that to court. They denied my ex parte. I was extremely shocked. Me and my attorney thought that they What had, does that mean, deny your ex parte? They denied it pending hearing, but essentially there's an ex parte. It's an emergency custody order that the court has to take upon immediately. And essentially, they have to take whatever you say is true. And now I'm not even sure that's a good thing. That's not really aligned with our justice system, but maybe it's good in some sense for because kids are seriously in danger, as long as maybe if the parent lies, they're punished later for lying. But essentially, they take these very seriously. And the court was told what had happened and the allegations, and they, didn't, they denied it, which was shocking. But thankfully, CPS, San Francisco, California, stepped up and said, that's okay. I'm not going to let him go back to her. And we're going to make sure he's safe and keep him with you for the time being while we do our investigation. I feel like it was, I just got incredible CPS workers that really cared about children and not about politics. Um, yeah, they, they put politics aside, though. They did what's best for Sawyer and keeping him safe. And they ended up coming to the conclusion that what's best for Sawyer was to give me full physical and legal custody of him. Me and my attorney were in agreement with that. Um, Sawyer's appointed attorney was in agreement with that, and there was only mom and her attorney that weren't. But we ended up settling it before court, and I now have full physical custody of Sawyer, split legal custody, but with the decision-making ability. And then there's a bunch of safety precautions when his mom gets to visit with him. Congratulations on getting full custody. I can only imagine what a relief that must be for you. Yeah, thank you. It's it's wild. Uh, a few things here. So first of all, you got full custody, but the key the key point here though is it wasn't anything to do with her transing, trying to transition. You're now he's now four, Sawyer's four, but it was more because of violence and uh, her behavior that disqualified her before CPS to continue to have custody. So I bring that up because in the case that she wasn't being violent, if in the case that a spouse or a parent is not, let's just say, let me start that again. In the case that a parent is not being violent, they're maybe not abusing drugs or alcohol, but they're actively trying to transition a three-year-old. And the other parent says, this is crazy. What are we doing? Right? Please stop. What would happen to the best of your knowledge based on the current legal system and the court system in California to a couple like that? Is there any standing for the parent that says, please stop, please stop transitioning a three-year-old? Basically, you're at the mercy of the judge. I've had a lot of parents come out to me. I'm part of that army and our duty. And unfortunately, there's cases like Jeff Younger and Adam Vina where they aren't seeing that their kid for that exact reason. And I think it's heartbreaking. It's totally dependent on the judge. There's basically no case law, to my knowledge, about this. I did make it a point for that trial to bring up the gender stuff. I did make it a point to bring it up to CPS. But that didn't really it was impact. Definitely, yeah, it they, didn't make they, an impact for them. They were like... I. I hear you, man, but like, let's just stay focused on her mental health and her violence. What kind of impact did you see on Sawyer for what uh, his mother was trying to do with him in terms of transitioning him? Can you share more about that? Yeah, um, he would get very upset about it. He would tell me stories. There was a time where she took him to Disneyland and he said, Dada, when I went to Disneyland, I couldn't go on the rides unless I wore my princess shoes. And I didn't want to wear princess shoes. I wanted to wear boy shoes. And, you know, that was heartbreaking. And I've just always done my best to just tell him, like, you're a boy. I'm a boy. We'll always be boys. Like, your grandpa's a boy. Your uncle's a boy. Kevin's a boy. All these people, right? And just, like, that can never change. Like, don't you see how none of us ever wear dresses or makeup? That's for a reason. Just, I'm just so thankful that he, he knows he's a boy. I mean, if you even call him, like, girly, he'll just yell at you. I'm a boy, not a girl. I'm just so glad he has that rebellious spirit. He's a rebel. And he just knows the truth. And I just love him so much. I want him to be happy with who he is. So uh, now that you have full custody of Sawyer, what does life look like for you guys? Now that I have full custody of Sawyer, life looks extremely optimistic and wonderful. I just want to guide him, support him, love him, watch him grow, teach him things, have fun with him. Like we play all these sports like football and hockey and we ride motorcycles and we light <laughs> fireworks and just all the coolest stuff ever that I'm so thankful my dad did with me and I just try to do all these fun things with him and encourage him to grow and just try to teach him to be a good person and a good man and just instill values in him and you know hopefully he'll have a larger family someday and he'll have his own family someday and 
this will all be behind us. When you say hopefully he'll have a larger family, do you mean siblings? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm as one of eight kids having siblings for me is like the best thing ever, especially as you get older. I'm one of four. So I totally agree. It's the best. Um, what's your hope with your story, Harrison? What, do, what is your hope that, for what your story and the impact it can have in the world? I hope that my story can inspire other people to start to speak up about this, to start to speak what's in their mind and on their hearts, just to have courage. I hope that we can save kids. I hope we can save kids' lives. I hope we can save kids from gender ideology. I hope we can start a movement to just draw a line in the sand and say no more. We're protecting kids. No matter what, this stuff is wrong. We all know it. I hope that my story can just make the everyday person get off their couch and start to speak up. What are you planning to do in the future now that you've, you have custody of Sawyer, but now that you have won this victory, do you have plans for what you want to do? I mean, you're continuing to speak out, but do you have any other plans for what you want to do? I'm interested in starting a nonprofit to help kids battling through this. Mm -hmm. I think that that's something we're in need of. I think family courts are very flawed and I think that gender ideology should be nowhere near children. I am interested in just doing whatever it takes to ensure that we have a bright future for Sawyer and our grandkids and your kids. It's beautiful. Harrison, thank you so much for sharing your story and fighting for your son and being an inspiration to other people because I'm sure a lot of people have been encouraged by your example. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. We're going to be doing another news roundup soon. I will find some more positive news for you because this one was a heavy one. Please pray. Pray for the protection of all children, born and unborn. Pray for this election. I mean, it was a tough one. We'll do another episode specifically on the different candidates beyond Kamala and Walls. But the reality is our country always is in need of your prayer. And it's always in need of you speaking the truth with love wherever you are, wherever you find yourself. I believe that if enough people pray and enough people live the truth and speak by the truth, we can change the face of the country. Thanks so much for listening to the show and we'll see you next time. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.